This is a Blaring Out with Eric Blair Show, and today I'm pleased to have, you know him from the bands Rainbow, the Michael Shanker Group, and Alcatraz, the man, the myth, the legend, Graham Bonnet. How you doing today? I'm overwhelmed. <laughs> That's amazing. Thank I'm doing okay. Not too bad. Busy, but uh, all right. Thanks. Yeah, I noticed that there's been like a resurgence. You've never stopped rocking, but there's been a resurgence as of late with your career. W what is that? Uh, well, I have a new band is uh, one reason, and uh, it's uh, kind of cool to actually start over again. I want to do something different, get away from the Alcatraz Rainbow kind of era and MSG era. But of course, when we go out to play live, we're doing all that stuff anyway. So we're doing a bit of everything when we go on tour again uh, in about a month. We're going back to uh, Europe. Uh, we just got back from England. We did a great tour over there. It was really good fun. Uh, so I wanted to do something different. At first, I thought, how about acoustic? And um, my friend said, are you fucking kidding me? He said, no way, no way. But we started off with my girlfriend, who is not here today, but she's a bass player in the band. And we were going to do... Is that Bethany? Bethany, yeah. We said, okay, let's try this out. We rehearsed with a guy called Mario Pargo, who's a friend of mine. He's worked with Cozy Powell in the past and with me on uh, albums I've done. And um, we started, he lives uh, up in uh, Vegas. So we started to rehearse together and thought, is this going okay? And after a while, Mario said, look, I don't have time to do this. So we turned around and started to think, well, what do we do now? And people suggested you need to do basically what you're kind of known for. You know, I know that Richie Blackmore is doing something completely different, as they were saying, Monty Python. But um, it, I don't know if it's working for him now. He's going back to the rainbow thing again. Mm -hmm. So um, I thought, well, okay, I think you're probably right. We should do a rock band, and that's exactly what we're doing now. At what age did you discover that you could sing well? Um, probably when I was about five. Um, uh, I used to walk around the house singing to the radio. If it was Mario Lanza on there or some opera singer or other, I would go around the house singing along with the radio. And my mum and dad used to laugh and go, God, your voice is loud, boy. You know, and I'd say, oh. And they said, but it's very good. And so um, they encouraged me since I was a little kid to really go out there and perform. And I think my first concert was when I was about seven when I was in the uh, Cub Scouts in England. And so in the church hall, you know, I sang a Paul Anker song. It was called uh, Diana. And I remember singing that to this day. And all the kids going, wow, where did that voice come from, from such a little boy? You know, so anyway, I'm showing off a bit here. <laughs> you know, it was kind of cool that people thought I was good. And um, so I pursued that. Um, even though I had like a regular job in the daytime when I was uh, in, in my teens, I'd always be playing at night in some band or other. What was your childhood like? Did, were, were, were your, was there a lot of love in your family? Uh, absolutely. I think I was probably one of the most lucky kids ever. You know, I hear horrible stories from my girlfriend, from my guitar player, how their families were split apart and nobody really loved them. My family was the opposite. I had a loving brother, a loving mum mom and dad who really supported what I was doing, even though it was nuts to actually think I could pursue this career from the town I was in. It was a small town in England, and nobody did anything that was, like, out of the, the box, mm -hmm. you know. So um, they, they were very... My mum was very musical. She had a natural ability to hear harmony, and at Christmas time there was always a party, and we all sang together. My uncles would play trumpets and accordions and whatever. So... I, the, the, my family life was great. So you always believed in yourself. There was never any negativity in your mind, like, I can't accomplish this or I can't accomplish that. Well, you know, at first I thought, well, it's a great hobby, but it's not a real job, is it? You know, so I worked as a butcher, you know, when I was 15 for three years until I was 18 years old. And um, I hated it because I'm a vegetarian. Well, I'm a vegetarian now, but back then I was eating meat. But it was... Um, a horrible, horrible job. You know, you can imagine what it's like, the slaughterhouse and all the rest of it, and cutting up a whole beautiful animal. And um, I uh, sort of played, as I said, I played kind of in a band at night, and this was my real job. But um, one day when I was about 18, I think I was 18 years old, uh, my cousin Trevor said to me, You've got, we've got to move out of here. So you can't, you can't stay in Skegness, that's the name of the town I was born in this small town, because nothing happens here. You, you won't get a, a musical career out of just hanging around here. It's great to be a big wheel in a small town, but you've got to be a big wheel in a big town. So we moved to London. How close were you with your cousin, Trevor Gordon? Very close. He, um, in fact, that was his guitar. You just saw it go out the door. Wow. Um, yeah, he, he um, died a couple of years ago. And um, he, uh, that, oh, sorry. I'm, 
the Les Paul you saw leave the house to be looked at and corrected and straightened out is, um, in fact, Trevor's uh, that I just got about uh, two months ago when I was playing in England. My nieces and nephews brought it over to one of the gigs. And I'm really proud to have it because uh, Trevor lived with me and my mum and dad um, for a long time when he was a kid because his parents would go backwards and forwards from Australia to England. His dad was um, a, a builder, and so he'd work in Australia in the summer, the Australian summer, and then come back to England for the British summer and work in England uh, building houses. And um, so Trevor was like backwards and forwards, and he came to my school and we played together in the playground and everything since we were 11 years old. Play guitar. He taught me how to play guitar, basically, wow. Trevor. And he was like my other brother, you know. I, I miss him, and um, he was a great influence on me because of his career. I mean, he started in television in Australia when he was 12 or 13. And he worked with the Bee Gees. He played guitar in the, on Bee Gees records. And that's kind of how I got into the business, was through my cousin Trevor being the guitar player, ex-guitar player from the Bee Gees, and moving to London and then meeting the Bee Gees in London, he and I, and then uh, Barry Gibb wrote a song for us. Is it true that Robert Stigwood came to see the Graham Bonnet set at the club and you guys were playing together? Yeah, what it, what it was, was um, there was an old manager of, tre of um, the Bee Gees in the audience. It wasn't Robert Stigwood. It was um, a guy called, um, I think his name was Ozzy Byrne, I think. Mm. And he was in the audience with a couple of Australian singers. And we played at this club called the Revolution Club in London, uh, me and Trevor and four other guys. He just happened to be there. It was a complete fluke. And he said to Trevor, hey, Trevor, remember me? Came up after we finished. He said, look, it's me, blah, blah, blah. He said, I'm sure Barry would love to talk to you, Barry and Morris and Robin, you know. And Trevor goes, oh, my God, really? Where are they? You know, so next day, Trevor goes along to Barry's place with, with Robert, where Robert Stigwood was and, um, you know, sort of spoke about the, van, the band we're in and what we're doing. And um, Barry said, well, how about we do some records with you, Trevor? And Trevor said, well, my cousin sings also. So I went along like a couple of days later and sort of sat around playing my acoustic with Barry, Robin and Morris doing Beach Boys tunes and Stevie Wonder songs and whatever. And Stigler walks into the room and says, um, OK, you boys are making a record very soon. Barry, do you have a song? It was like... Well, it was like a bad movie. It was like a bad movie, you know. And um, but within a week, we were in the in the studio recording with Barry. So, what were the highlights of working with the Bee Gees on what was to become the Marbles' first album? Uh, well, I remember the first day that um, Barry came up with a tune for us to record. It was eventually called Only One Woman, but he had this melody in his head that was like, um, it was in 3-4 time, which was kind of weird. It was kind of like a country song, but R&B, and it had this thing, da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-
the success of only a woman change your ego? Did it give you guys bigger egos? I, it didn't really change me or my cousin, I don't think, because Trevor had been through all that sort of adoration thing sort of mm -hmm. before when he was a, a kid, you know, 13 years old uh, on TV in Australia. You know, it's, I know it's a different country and everything, but it's still the same. Oh, wow, you know, kind of have your autograph and all that kind of thing. And I just remember we were on the front of the New Musical Express and um, I bought it on the way to the train station, on, to, on the way to the tube, you know, the underground. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember opening it up and going, oh, we're on the front. I don't want people to see that that's me looking at the... I felt kind of embarrassed. There was kind of a thing going on there that people may, you know, may recognize me. But of course they didn't. I mean, the record had only been out for like a couple of weeks or something. But um, it didn't really change us at all, no. I, I'm still the same, you know. When I meet people now, they say, you're just an ordinary guy. And I say, well, yeah. Well, aren't you? You know, what's the, there's nothing, oh, I'm just a singer. That's all I am. I'm not a fucking brain surgeon. I'm just a guy who sings. And this is all I do. I have no other talent. And I try to do this the best I can. But I never have had that ego-y thing and, oh, I should be doing that and that guy shouldn't do it or I'm, you know, whatever. Never, I've never had that and never will. Um, so you es essentially could live without the fame? Uh, yeah, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. But I like to do a good job. I like people to say, that's good. Yeah, sure. But um, yeah. Tell me what it was like to be a part of the swinging 60s and how did things differ then than, they, than the world compared to the world today? Well, in England, anyway, the 60s were pretty much like the 80s were here. It was all, everything was happening. It was very alive and fun. Everybody was out trying to do something new. People had big hair here and in England, um, it was uh, the Beatle haircut and everything. Uh, but um, the 60s, for me, uh, going out to clubs and seeing like everyone who was on TV and famous. It was incredible. Jimi Hendrix and Paul McCartney. It was a club we used to go to called um, the Speakeasy. And after our, after like um, 12 o'clock, people get up and jam. If there was anybody in the audience that was kind of well-known-ish, like Paul or John or whomever, or Jimi Hendrix was always there, um, would get up and play, you know. And it was incredible to see these guys just get up and jam Johnny Be Good or something. You know, it was like, Ooh, bloody hell, you know. So I would go there with Morris Gibb, as I was saying, and Barry, he would go off. And, but it was um, a really happening time, and suddenly... And then about in the 70s, it all kind of died for me because that's when the punk era came around and um, it, Boy George and all that stuff. It was like, oh my God, what am I doing here? And that's when I decided to move. I was offered a job with Rainbow and I decided that uh, probably it's a long way to go to rehearsal from England to America. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but the 60s, I'll never forget because the fashion changed and everything. You know, it was a really, really good time. What was magical about your relationship with Adrian Pasta? Uh, um, <laughs> well, she was um, an actress I kind of uh, sort of fell in love with watching her on TV and with my, with my cousin again. And Trevor saying, she's nice, isn't she? I said, yeah, she is. I'd love to meet her one day. Anyway, talking about the Speakeasy Club, we, we were in the Speakeasy one night and our record was out and played on the radio, only one woman. And... Um, this girl comes running out to me. It was her, out, out of the blue. It was Adrian Pasta. And she came up to me, she said, she grabbed me, she said, I love your voice. And I said, oh, I love your acting. <laughs> you know, I was like, what? And um, she said, yeah, anyway, I'm going now. I'm Bye-bye. Uh, and she was with um, a guy that was in a band called Grapefruit that was John Lennon's uh, band um, that he put together with Yoko. And uh, uh, Pete, his name was. And so she went off with Pete. And like next day, I had a call from her because she asked somebody for my number. And she said, I've, um, I'm through with Pete. Can I come and see you? I said, well, well yeah. And um, so we got married eventually. We were together for seven years. And the two years we were married were like awful. And that's when we got divorced because the two years of marriage were somehow... Uh, different. I don't know why. That piece of paper made a lot of difference. But it was a good relationship. She's a funny girl. And uh, I guess still is. She's a, an acting teacher now, I believe. So you had five good years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Before the paper was signed. Yeah, yeah. And then, <laughs> then that was like, oh, God. Well, then things started to happen. It started to break up. And I knew that something was going on between her and different people. And because uh, she was always out on the road acting, doing plays or whatever, or, you know, uh, things for TV. And I go, well, are you there? Where are you? You know, call up and she wouldn't be there. And um, mm, 
Okay. And I found out later what was going on. She was uh, two-timing, you know. Well, you know what? You had that good five years, which oh, yeah. is an awesome chapter of your yes. life that you yes. can look back on. Yes, I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it was, uh, I'm grateful to have her around because she, she taught me a lot about, you know, acting and whatever. And uh, it was nice to go along and visit her on set and things like that. It was, um, it was very cool. So how did you come to join Rainbow? They were putting together, the, uh, you know, trying to find a singer for the band. And uh, they're out in the middle of nowhere in uh, France or Switzerland on the border of uh, Switzerland and France at this chateau place and they'd rehearsed with um, I think 70 something singers and one day they were playing a game called Spot the Tune and Cozy had a, a cassette remember cassette machines mm -hmm. remember um, he put a cassette in the machine and said who's this and it was only one woman the Barry Gibbs song that he wrote for us and um, Richie said oh yeah he said where is he now and Roger said, well, I'm working with a friend of his, Mickey Moody, who was a guitar player. And he said, I can get in touch with him. And so they got in touch with me and I went over there. I had to learn a Rainbow song. I knew nothing about Rainbow whatsoever. I thought they were a folk group. Rainbow, you know, it sounds like a folk group. I said, Rainbow, who the hell's that? And then I was told that it was like deep purple-ish. And uh, so I learned a song called Mistreated. And that was my audition piece when I went over there and sang at them and they gave me the job. Now, I, I, uh, who do you think you bonded with the most in Rainbow? Well, Richie and Don and Cozy, those three. So uh, you had a close, you had a close relationship with all three of those guys. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Richie was a good, a good. He was a good guy, but he's a very shy person. So he gives that um, imp the impression that he's kind of like standoffish, but he's not at all. He's very. He picks his friends. You know, and uh, he was very close to me, even though it was probably just before the gig. We talk a lot in the daytime. He was with his girlfriend and I was with my girlfriend. And, you know, but at night we'd always get together in the dressing room, he and I, and say, what can we do tonight, as, you know, to make it fun, a joke or something. Let's, let's do a joke with on Don or on Cozy. Let's, let's do this and, you know, mess him up. You know, OK, okay. you know, things like that. And um, it was uh, Don and Cozy, Cozy was very close to me, and Don still is, obviously. But Don and Cozy, probably more so than Richie, because we had sort of separate lives with our girls, you know, girlfriends and wives or whatever. Uh, but um, Don is still a close friend, and uh, Cozy was, you know. Um, he worked with me later, way after Rainbow as well, you know. Did Richie Blackmore ever compliment you? Uh, always, yeah. But he didn't like my hair. <laughs> oh, that's true. Yeah, that's such. They make yeah. such a big deal about yeah. that. I mean, do you really think it was that big of a deal? No, I mean he. That's um, little documentary about Richie. That he's, I think it's kind of tongue in cheek. Where he goes, "Well, it's Graham's hair," you know. It, you know, he's been all serious about. It, but I think he's uh, going, "Yeah," you know, he's just talking about it. It's kind of a joke now. But it was. Um, it wasn't that big of a deal. I went out one afternoon with my ex-wife in. Scotland or somewhere, and then I said, oh, you know, my hair's still, mm. it was all tatty around the back and long, that's how I'd go and get my hair cut, and that's all it was. It's completely innocent, nothing to do with destroying the band's image or anything, you know. Well, I thought it was nice to mix it up a little bit. Well, yeah, but it, it was funny that, like, the next day there was a meeting, a band meeting about it, about my head, you know. <laughs> What's on top of your head, this hair thing, you know, why isn't it longer? And, and I remember Richie going like, well, if it got a bit long, you go look across the restaurant or wherever we were at the time and go, yeah. and I go, what? No, 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 no. <laughs> you know, anyway, it's a thing. What is your greatest extravagance? Probably bicycles. <laughs> bicycles and guitar. I, I, you're talking about like spending on things kind of thing. Yeah, guitars I've had to get rid of because I had too many. I was like building a house from the damn things, you know. There's so many pieces of wood and wire hanging around the house. I'm thinking, well, what the hell have I got all these things for? But they're so beautiful to look at uh, as well as play. And um, that was one of my vices or extravagances and uh, uh, bicycles. Um, the one I have now is like a, an expensive ish bike, you know, a Trek, and they cost a lot of money. I had one before that was stolen, and uh, I just put it outside for a couple of minutes while I went into a store. Came outside, it was gone, yeah. and you know, like like that. And I, I reported it to the police, and they just said, "You won't find that. You won't get that back." What or who is the greatest love of your life? Uh, the person I'm with now, <laughs> I think, apart from myself. No, no. Um, yeah, I think Bethany has uh, turned me around. She's made me realize that um, getting old is a good thing and that I still can do what I thought maybe I wouldn't be doing at my age and um, made me realize I, I can do it. 
you know, and my family as well have supported me with that. My, you know, when I saw them in England, they said, God, Graham, you're really cracking it, aren't you? As they say over there. Um, I said, yeah, I'm doing better because of the encouragement I get from her. Uh, I think um, it's made me a slightly different person, you know, and I'm very grateful to her for that. And uh, thanks, Bethany. <laughs> yeah, well, love will do that. Love will either, like, heal you or make break your heart. Yeah, I, I, she does that sometimes, but uh, not really. I get jealous sometimes, which is ridiculous, but... Um, you know, I don't like when she talks to other guys sometimes, and that's a natural thing. That I think. is a natural thing. It is. And part of being a man. I know, exactly. Yeah. But she she doesn't get it, you know, because if I talk to another woman, it doesn't phase her at all. She's very she's very sensible and very grown up. I'm a kid, you know. What can I say? You got to be. You're yeah. a front man. I am. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so in 1982, you joined the Michael Shanker group. Hmm. How did you approach the songwriting process for the Assault Attack album, and what was it like working with producer Martin Birch? Well, was working with Martin was amazing. You know, he's an incredible producer. Um, we, uh, well, I was given a tape by Michael with three songs on it. It said, Urgent, Need Lyrics. I remember it coming in the mail. I'm going, oh, shit. I've never written any lyrics for, like, 2,000 years. What can I do? And I remember sitting in the rehearsal room, and uh, he had this riff going, and, he said, and they said to me, just just write some words. I, I can't write in English, you know. I said, well, can you try? <laughs> you know? I said, I, what do you want me to do? He said, well, you have to, we have to put this down tomorrow and make, uh, you know, some kind of demo. I, I said, oh, okay. And so I just wrote whatever came into my head. And I found that from that experience later on, when I had my own band later, after the Michael Shank thing, I really got into writing songs, that words that were kind of poetic and had certain meanings and double meanings and all that kind of thing. I got cleverer. <laughs> cleverer. Mm -hmm. So um, it was um, an experience that I didn't really realize I had to go through because I always thought that somebody else would write the words, but I had to do it because no one else could do it. So I thank you, Michael, for that, you know. I really do. Tell me about Martin Birch. What was his unique approach to producing albums? As far as a vocalist is concerned, he's really good with, with vocal sounds and, um, you know, um, pitching and tuning and all the rest of it. And he would say to me, he was really, really on it, you know. He would say to me, Graham, have you been drinking? I said, what do you mean? He said, you've had a beer, haven't you? I said, you know, I'm in the studio. And he's going, you've had a beer, haven't you? You know, what? You know, <laughs> he said, yeah, you've... Yeah, just fuck off, will you? Go, go, I'm going to get Michael in. Go back. Go back to your room. What? How did he know? But he could hear, because of uh, what I've been drinking, I mean, I don't drink anymore, but this is back then, they were like 20,000 pints of beer a day. Uh, he said, you, you've got to go back. Come, come later when that beer is gone from your throat, you know. So he was really metic meticulous on the vocal sound and he was a he listened to every damn thing i did he made me do things over and over and over and over again as we did back then uh -huh. there were no pro tools and tuning and all that shit we had to re-record everything if it was one word out he would say pop that in just go huh you know i said okay and he put it in yeah and that's it okay but he was really one of the best no doubt what led to you oh. exiting the Michael Schenker group. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, yeah, the pants, yeah. It was, um, yeah, Sheffield, I'll never forget it. And um, it was a, a very drunken afternoon. White Snake were opening up for us. And uh, we, <laughs> me and the, the boys from White Snake, we all went to the pub in the afternoon. And I came back to the theater, I mean, the place we were playing, uh, college, whatever it was, and back to my dressing room, completely shit-faced. And um, knocking on Michael's door saying, can I, can I get my jacket, Michael, please? I've got my wallet in there. And he goes, no, go away. I'm asleep. Uh, I said, come on, open the fucking door. Let me in and get, just get my jacket, please. No, no. So that was that. I went back, started drinking again. And um, I had all, I had to learn two albums worth of songs from the old Michael Shanker stuff and the new stuff I just made up, all the new lyrics. And they're all the way across the, the front of the stage next to the monitors. And what happened when we actually went on stage, when I was like, and completely gone, the, the audience pushed forward. The monitors went onto the paper and screwed everything up. So I couldn't read the words. And I, I went, you fuck. I started swearing at the audience. And we got through like half a song. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, fuck this. And I just walked off and walked off, off stage. And they ended up, what actually happened was, they ended up playing instrumentally the whole fucking set. 
the whole thing. And I went downstairs to the dressing room in, in the place, the college, and uh, one of our tour guys came down and he said, you've got to get the fuck out of here. He said, you've got to go. They're going to fucking kill you. So I was in a taxi back to the hotel the next morning on a train to King's Cross in London. And I got back there and my manager met me there and he said, um, are you all right, Graham? I said, no, I'm not. I said, I got really, really drunk yesterday. I'm so hungover now. And so we got the big show to do in a couple of days and we're headlining. And he said, no, you're not. I said, what do you mean? He said, they fired you. And uh, I was on the plane that afternoon back to L.A. It was horrible. What is your secret to not becoming a casualty to sex, drugs, and groupies on the road? My secret? Uh, there, there isn't one. <laughs> I, I, I just know that um, what happened to me, what turned me around, probably, I think it's about 14 years ago. I, I've been sober all that, all that time, uh, that, that amount of time so far. So far. Uh, no, I'm fine now. But um, I, I went out with my two dogs onto the hillside when I lived in um, uh, Santa Clarita, uh, which is not here, obviously. We're in Studio City now. Um, yes, we are, aren't we? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, just kidding. Um, and I went onto the hills with my dogs, and it had been raining, and I was drunk, and I, I slipped down the hillside in all the mud uh, to the back gate of our property, and I'm lying there, just the dogs wagging their tails and walking around me and around me. And um, the gate opened and my two uh, kids were there, my twins. And uh, they looked down at me and said, Dad, Dad, what's up, Dad? What's wrong with you, Dad? And then my ex-wife coming over, you wonder why she's my ex-wife, uh, coming over and going, uh, kids, that's your father. And one kid took one leg, the other kid took the other, and they dragged me into the house on my back. That afternoon... I went to AA and I walked in and uh, the guy looked at me and said, you need help, don't you? I said, yes, I do. And uh, that was 14 years ago. And I went to some meetings for about a year and I decided, no, nah, I can do this on my own. I don't need to go there and I'm not a religious person, you know, and they do all that uh, God thingy and praying and everything. And I, I'm not into that at all. Whether other people are, that's fine. But with me, I, I don't dig that. And so um, I said, look, I, do you mind if I don't come anymore? I said, I, I can't do this because I'm being, you know, not being honest. So I did it on my own. And so to this day, I won't even take a throat spray that has alcohol in it or anything like that, you know. Do you think that that kind of behavior comes from being young and, and having a, a model of people telling you this is how you have to live if you're in rock and roll? Yeah, because everybody did. I mean, it's, it's an unnatural life. You've got to be alive at times when you shouldn't be at three o'clock in the morning and on stage or whatever the hell it may be. And then get up next day really early to get into the next town. And then you've got to sleep and you can't sleep. So you say something, you take up, down, up, down, up, down. It's like that all the time. It's unnatural. And so you use unnatural uh, chemicals to keep you alive uh, but it does kill you in the end it will and so i decided not to so how does how for you how did unhealthy anarchy turn into healthy anarchy well uh it was uh hmm it was my decision it was either you know live or die and um I, I am a healthy person. I try to eat. I don't eat meat. I try to stay healthy. I like to ride my bicycle, as I said. And um, when you're drunk and riding a bicycle, it doesn't work. So you've got you've to gotta be sober. And for what I do, when you're drunk, you think you're doing great. <laughs> but you're not. I've heard recordings, and it's like, shit, you know. And I, I think on the, at the moment, and the audience is going, because they're all drunk too, <laughs> you think you're doing right. But no, you're not. I remember one concert we did. Uh, Don Airy and I said, wow, what a great show. We've got to hear that tape. We went back uh, to the hotel or something and heard the tape from the board out front, you know, the soundboard. And uh, it was shit. Every one of us was out of tune. The um, bass was out of tune with the guitar. The guitar was out of tune with me. I was out of tune with the keyboards. It was a wreck. But the, the show was unbelievable. And I was thinking, I'm, but anyway. Now, being sober, I see clearer, and uh, I think clearer than I used to do, more clearly. And uh, it's, um, it's a new life, I tell you. You know, and anybody that is sober now will tell you the same thing.
and and it's amazing you found love and that's very important Got to to keep you sober also uh, absolutely because uh, she doesn't drink uh, she has like half a glass and she's had enough of wine let's say um and she's very you know careful with her health too because you know it's great fun to do it but it will take you down yeah. there's no doubt about it what was your original vision for alcatraz and did it live up to your expectations all right well i was basically putting a band together that was hopefully going to be kind of like rainbow deep purple kind of a vibe and keyboards you know same lineup same kind of instrumentation and um that's kind of oh, excuse me and again that's kind of what happened uh anyway we put the the band together in my garage and uh it was uh, like well how how far is this going to go and we eventually got a record deal which was kind of surprising but at the same time not because i just sort of left uh, rainbow michael shanky i think so i still had sort of a so-called name mm -hmm. and um so it was an experiment i thought well it ain't bad that when we finished the album i thought well that's pretty good as a first attempt but I think, I think we can do better, I was thinking in my head, you know. And then suddenly we find out that uh, in Japan it had gone, the album had gone gold. And that kind of blew me away. It was like, are you kidding me? You know, and wow. And so after that, from going gold in Japan, we toured in uh, the States, you know. So it was a surprise, but a nice one. Now, how did your songwriting relationships differ between guitarist Ingve Malmsteen and Steve Vai? Oh, it's pretty much the same, but I found that with Steve, there was more opportunity for me to write better melodies, I think, and not kind of fit in where the guitar solo ends. You know, Ingve was trying to show the world what he could do, mm -hmm. which I quite understand, you know, and uh, he, he impressed everyone, no doubt about it. He's a great damn guitar player. And um, with Steve, he was more of a songwriter as such. You know, he had elements of songs that took a left turn when you think it's going to go straight ahead. You know, and I like that. You know, I like a bit of, you know, oh, what can I do here? Oh, 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 I know, I know. You know, so with Steve, I really enjoyed the second album we did. What advice would you give the younger you? The younger me, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Get a real job. <laughs> um, yeah, look after, um, I think look after the business side more than I did, you know, because I am not Mr. Businessman at all. From the word go, you know, when I was 19 years old, um, you know, back in the 60s, um, when we first started to record, my cousin and I, everything was taken care of. Our tax, our housing, our blah, 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 everything. Check. I never signed a check ever or anything. So I was totally shielded from the real world. And to this day, I'm still a baby when it comes to the biz because I don't know what to do. You know, taxes and things. What, what do you mean? What, what do I do? What's a, a what form? A what, eh? You know, I don't know what they are. To, and the people of my age are, that are the same, they go, what's, what's that? And they don't drive. I don't drive. Really? Richie didn't drive until probably 12 years ago. And he didn't drive either because there's always someone to take you yeah. wherever you're going. You know, I was spoiled like all the other brats back then. You know, I was one of them, you know. So the business side is something that I think kids now actually do look at. They're more business savvy than I was. Well, you know, it's funny. Um, Ronnie James Dio told me the same thing. He goes, I don't know anything about any of that stuff. He goes, yeah. I'm an artist. Yeah. He goes, that's why I have a manager yeah. because I can't be concerned with that stuff. I write songs and get on stage and sing. Yeah. Period. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. He's the same as me. Yeah. You know, I, I think I spoke to him about the same thing thinking back and I, yeah, I remember one day saying to him, um, what do you see from Rainbow? He said, he said fuck all. I said, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. And well, who got the money? I don't know. <laughs> What did you think of Dio as a performer and singer? Oh, I thought he was great, you know. He was a good friend and, um, you know, he was always very complimentary and, you know, I supported him. I always used to go to the last shows he did, you know, and support him. He's, um, he's a good guy, you know. I, 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 and we weren't close friends or anything, but we sometimes hung out. The Grand Bonnet Band, what inspired the, the song for your new two-song EP, My Kingdom Come? What inspired the lyrics? Uh, well, Russ Ballard wrote uh, My Kingdom Come, the guy that wrote Since You've Been Gone, who I just saw in London. He came to the gig and he was like, whoa! He comes back and he is really excited about the band and he wants to write another song now. Um, but he wrote that, so that's his baby. The other one, The Mirror Lies, is one I made up um, and um, it was just about looking, you know, obs uh, 
observing people at um, Venice Beach, basically. You know, that parade of people that go by and how everybody's so different and they all think they look fabulous when they go out. Like we all do. We look in the mirror and go, you know, that Fonzie thing. Yeah. He goes, uh, ah. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's okay. I look great. But sometimes the mirror lies. It's based, based around that, you know, like we all think we look great, but maybe not. Um, so that's what the song is about. And it's kind of not heavy as such, but it has elements of heaviness and a little bit of boogie-woogie in the middle. But uh, the Kingdom Come one is very, very Russ Ballard. Yeah. So he didn't tell you what his inspiration for the lyrics were? For that? No, no. I spoke to him on the phone about it. I said, what I'm looking for is something that's kind of like Queen come uh, Argent and a bit of Alcatraz and a bit of Rainbow. And, and so, we, uh, yeah, what about this bit? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's cool. Uh, the words, I don't know where he... I, I didn't even talk about the words. I was basically talking about the arrangement and the melody, you know. And he said, which, uh, you know, you're still getting up to the C sharps and Ds and whatever. I said, yeah, yeah. I said, OK, well, I'll do it in that range and da 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 And so he, the story he made up, I don't know where he got the idea from. I don't really know. But it's a good, good idea. Now, you have... You've got a record deal with Frontier Records. Mm -hmm. How excited are you about that? Well, I'm excited, but uh, the only thing I don't like is what we're doing right now, which is re record We've got two albums to make. One is of re-recordings of Since You've Been Gone, All Night Long, and some Alcatraz stuff, and some Michael Shanker stuff, which we've done already. I've done my favorite ones first. And um, then other tunes, I've did uh, solo things by myself. You know, um, obviously by myself. Solo is by myself, isn't it? I think, yeah. yeah. Uh, so um, some of that as well. That's the only thing that's kind of bugging me right now because the enthusiasm for actually going into a studio and recording again songs I've sung 10 billion times now over the years and finding that same spark is kind of hard to, like, uh, how many times can I sing since you've been gone and really sound like I mean it? It's different when you're in front of an audience because you get that feedback from them and they're going, yeah, and you go, yeah, okay, you know, but... That cold thing where you put everything under a microscope and go, oh, that note's bad. Oh, God, that's awful. You know, that's what I don't like about it. It's really analyzing every note and every word to make sure it's good for a, you know, recording, a, a studio recording. That's what I'm going through right now. And I think we have another um, probably five to do, and then we're finished with this. But, but it's like 16 tracks. That's a lot. And then we have the new stuff. But it's good. I think it's good that you have the opportunity to do this. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. I'm uh, thrilled that somebody actually cares. Yeah. You know, and thank you very much. Frontiers. Yeah, thank you. Exactly. <laughs> thank you. How did you feel about the passing of, of Keith Emerson? Well, that, I couldn't believe I thought it was some kind of stupid Facebook joke. Like they're always, you know, like Ringo saying that Paul really did die and all that kind of thing the other day. Because um, I saw him at the NAMM show probably about two years ago. And I was going to ask him to play some keyboards. And um, uh, I, I still can't believe it. It's just like, why? But I knew he had problems with his um, hands, um, had some kind of nerve damage or something. I, I, I didn't really talk about it. But I remember saying to Bethany, God, he's quiet. Why is he so damn quiet? You know, because I remember him being more outgoing. And um, obviously he was going through a lot of depression. I mean, the fr his friends that were in his band will know better than me if his personality changed. I mean, I didn't know him that closely, you know. But I knew him as a, you know, a, a guy just a, sort of, hey, what are you doing, blah, blah, blah. You know, have a chat. He wasn't a close friend. But I was going to ask him to play something, mm -hmm. you know, if he had an idea. And, uh, oh, God, it, it's just unbelievable. It seems like... This uh, this year, as we all know, it's like everybody's going. David Bowie, Glenn yeah. Fry, yeah. uh, Paul Kantner. Yeah, and they're all around 60-something, 60 68, yeah, 70, 70 yeah. which is kind of, it scares me. Well, the thing I don't like is that, that uh, a lot of the online news agencies, uh, music news agencies are saying this is the final curtain for classic rock. Uh, it could be. You know, go out there and buy a ticket while you can. Yeah. We'll see it live. Exactly. Fuck. I mean, no kidding. Really. So I'm, I'm still alive. Yeah. <laughs> That's our story, and we're sticking to it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so what were some of the highlights of working with him, pal Terry? I'm um, leaving the band. <laughs> <laughs> which, which time? The first time or the second? Oh, the second time. Um, no, it was, um, uh, it, was, um, it was difficult because that, um, I, was given, I was paid to do that job, and um, I really wasn't really that much into the band, but I... I I like what Chris does, but 
I wanted to get away from the, and the you know, all that stuff. Um, I wanted to hear, uh, I don't know, I wanted to hear Gary Moore or something or Jeff Beck. Or, you know, that's the kind of players I really I like. Feel. Yeah, feel and yeah. instead of like, look what I can do yeah. and, you know, sing everything high. But like, no, nah, I don't want to sing everything high. What does that prove? You can sing high. So, so what? You know, it doesn't mean anything. Anybody can sing high. It doesn't matter. Um, but um, it was with Chris, it was kind of like a project, so to speak. Uh, not so much as, um, uh, you know, being a band member, because always the impellatory troupe always changed personnel anyway. So there's always another singer, another guitar, another bass player, another drummer, you know. And so um, I, I, I think Chris would agree with that, that um, we were never meant to sort of go on the road and be together forever. Mr. Still, Max, yeah. dude, you that is so heavy. Yeah, and well, your vocals are just like on 10. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, that was hard work. I mean, we did that together. He was engineering and producing, whatever. And uh, it was, it was, yeah. <laughs> yeah well, that work is like everybody said, tells you that work is standing the test of time. And that's what's important. Yeah, I mean... Thank you, Chris, for a great job. But, you know, he, as I said, I don't think we're ever meant to be, like, together forever. Because I think I have different ideas about music, and him, he's younger than I am. And I have a lot of sort of music I like from the past, R&B and stuff like that, blues thingies, that I really am more into than sort of like the wiggly, 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 ah, you know, all that stuff. Because um, there's more to life than singing falsetto, you know. Um, and playing very fast. But um, he's really good at what he does. He's amazing. He really is. He is. What brings you the most peace in your life right now? Going to sleep. Um, I, let me think. Most peace. I think being happy with someone I love. Mm. And also, when I'm writing a lyric, I, I go into another place. It's very soothing and... Um, I don't know, it makes, makes my brain tick and just, oh yeah. I, I, I like to imagine another world, you know, when I'm writing words, which I didn't do when I was in Michael Shanko. <laughs> Write anything, oh, okay then. Um, it's, um, very, it's like writing your uh, diary or something when you're writing a, a story. I love to write a story and that takes me into a nice peaceful place. But sometimes it gets on my nerves as well. I go, what the hell do I write here? I try not to rhyme things, and I try not to make it go. You know, but if I just write, and then edit later, so don't do anything in rhythm. Just write as you would a journal. Just your thoughts that come into your head. I find that very relaxing. Graham Bonnet box set that's going to be released. Well, it's one that I did in 1975. It was my first attempt at being, you know, a songwriter, a singer. Uh, Paul McCartney had come out with his uh, first solo album. It was around that time. And uh, I thought, well, I'd like to do something like that. And that's what I did. So all the tunes on there are all different genres of music. It's not just like rock and roll or whatever. Mm -hmm. There's like 1930s kind of music and a bit of everything. Reggae, a little bit of stuff. And I played on stuff. And it was really fun to do. It was something that kind of showcased what I could do, you know. Uh, instead of just one area of singing high, which is okay, but, you know, there's more to singing than that. Couldn't find the reel to reel. There's, um, the actual tapes are missing. So what happened was my ex-producer, Kaplan Kay, who worked for Dick James Music in London, found a tape. And so we took the cassette tape, had it doctored, wow. and then uh, made it into a CD, uh, which will be happening soon. It's on its way, I believe. Um, which is all tunes that are, as I said, of every different kind of music. The one you're talking about, I think it's my first uh, solo album. Will You Still Love Me Tomorrow's on there? Uh, Will You Still Love yeah. Me Tomorrow? Yeah, that's why Richie made me play that on the Donington show. That was one of his favorite tracks. How do you feel about the future of the music business? I think it's gone down the shitter, basically. I mean, it's, um, the music business right now is non-existent. You know, as I was saying before, if you don't go out and play, nobody knows you exist. Nobody buys CDs anymore. Everybody's downloading, listening to music through little tiny me 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 me. Those little earphones that don't really give you the true vibe. Um, the music business, I would, if I was in it now, I would get out. I really would because it's non-productive. Everything is, um, you know, as we said before, auto-tuned and plastic and disco. You know, I don't really like what's going on right now. There's nothing new. Um, the new rock bands that are, are around now. There's nothing I've heard that, will, that makes me kind of go, wow, that's different or good. It's all rehashed um, 
sort of Led Zeppelin copy bands or sort of thing. Um, it's, um, I don't know, it's, it's just not very inspiring. That's why I'm looking forward to actually doing something new with this band. I guess you have kids mm. and grandkids. Yeah. So do you ever partake in anything they're listening to? Yeah, but all my kids like the Beatles. <laughs> they love the Beatles and my grandkids. They love the Beatles, the Beatles and um, the Beach Boys, which are my, I love Brian Wilson. I, he's one of my heroes. And the writing, he, not the surfy stuff, but the later, you know, Pet yeah, Sounds. And, oh, man, I mean, that, that is real stuff. But, of course, the Beatles, they're the guys that inspire me to do what I do. If it wasn't for them, we wouldn't have long hair and whatever else, you know. How do you think having kids and then grandkids change you as a person? Well, you become uh, sort of more relaxed and um, realize that you are now an adult, which is a hard thing to realize sometimes because all musicians are children. And um, it's, um, yeah, once in a while you have to like a, act like a big man, your age, you know. So I'm very proud of uh, my daughter's kids. They're, they're incredible. They're very intelligent. They make me look a bit stupid sometimes, even though they're very young. Um, it's great when you have to ask a kid how to work a computer, you know. How do you do this? I'll show you, Granddad. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> yeah, they, yeah, they certainly wake you up. So if you could assemble a dream band, alive or dead, any musician who would be in that band? Oh, it'd be definitely Cozy. Cozy would be there. Don Airy. Oh, Don Airy. Um, oh, my God. There's so many guitar players that I love. Hmm. Possibly Gary, Gary Moore, and um, let me think of somebody else. Well, I'll be singing. So, what have we got there? We got the keyboards, <laughs> guitar, the bass and the bass player. It would be probably Jack Bruce. Nice. Mm. Or uh, John Entwistle. Ranked uh, the top five tracks that you've done. Okay, <laughs> um, that's really hard. Uh, well, I'd say only one woman from the the sixties. Um, the Marbles, and uh, let me think. God bless video from Alcatraz. <laughs> uh, and probably Will You Be Home Tonight from Alcatraz, too, like that. Um, let me think. From Rainbow, Eyes of the World. Uh, how many is that? Three? My counting's not very good today. Three. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a song called A House Is Not a Home from the Marbles album which is a Burt Bacharach song. I like that vocal. And... <laughs> God! Uh, the walls fell down, the marbles. What's next for you? Uh, well, I'm going to... Uh, where am I going? I'm going to the Czech Republic in uh, about a week, uh, playing with an orchestra, a 30-piece orchestra, wow. doing three or four songs, I think. But um, possibly, you know, all night long, since you've been gone and uh, maybe a couple of rainbow tunes and a, an Alcatraz tune. Um, with Dan McCafferty, we'll be doing one, and John will probably do three from uh, Uriah Heep. So it'll be um, me and John will back up uh, Dan on one song, I think, because he's, you know, he's not uh, too well, actually. Yeah. So um, that's what we did before, and it's kind of cool to play with strings and all that, and timps, boom, boom, it's great. It's really good fun. So I'm looking forward to that. Graham yes. Bonnet, thank you so thank you. One more time. There you go. Thank you. thank you for being on the Blaring Out with Eric Blair show. You rock. No problem. All right. Anytime. Blaring Out with Eric Blair with Graham Bonnet signing off. The Blaring Out show.